Hello everyone, I'm Crosby Kemper, Director of the Institute of Museum and Library Services, and welcome to Visions of America, All Stories, All People, All Places. In this episode, we're in Kansas City, Missouri's historic 18th and Vine neighborhood to visit not one, but two museums that chronicle this community's contributions to a pair of uniquely American pastimes, the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum and the American Jazz Museum. Visions of America is coming up next. While we've already seen a few truly historic structures as part of our travels to some of the country's lesser known but no less important museums, sometimes it is not as much the space but the history that is being preserved inside that is the most important. We are here at 18th and Vine near downtown Kansas City, now the joint site of the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum and the American Jazz Museum. But we are also close to the heart of what was in the 1920s and 1930s, a cultural explosion of music, baseball, and barbecue that challenged and changed America. Jazz may have originated in New Orleans, but Kansas City developed its own big band style based on riffs, jams, and rooted in the blues which filled countless nightclubs and dance halls with passionate patrons on a nightly basis. Black-owned businesses were also flourishing in this neighborhood, like the nation's first Black-owned automobile dealership and the Kansas City Call, a Black-owned newspaper. But perhaps the most successful business that originated here had to do with America's game. This was the home to the Kansas City Monarchs. And today, 18th and Vine is home to the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, dedicated to telling the stories of those brave Americans who wouldn't take no for an answer. The first person I'm meeting on our visit here is Bob Kendrick, the president of the museum, to get a tour of the exhibits here and talk about this important chapter in the story of America's pastime and how it still continues to resonate in the community today. Bob, it's so great to see you and see you here in the Negro Leagues Museum. And it's an important moment in the history of the Negro Leagues Museum because you're about to do a major expansion. Yes. But, but I want to ask you this question. Why is the Negro Leagues Museum here in Kansas City at 18th and Vine? And that's the question that is commonly asked by so many of the folks who come to visit us is why is a Negro Leagues Museum in Kansas City? And the answer is actually quite simple because Kansas City is the birthplace of the Negro Leagues. Right. The leagues were formed right here in Kansas City in this very area that we're A couple of blocks in, Just a couple away. of blocks away. Yeah. The old Paseo YMCA. Right. The building still stands. Right. We've now designated it as the home of the future Buck O'Neill Education and Research Center. So we're saving that historic landmark and then going to basically go full circle right back to the very building that it all Where it started. started. In 1920. 1920. And so we're, we're at the 103rd anniversary of the Negro Leagues. It's a huge importance in American history because it, it highlights the segregation that was a, a part of our world for so long, too long. There was black baseball before the Negro Leagues. Absolutely. And, and then there was something called the Gentleman's Agreement. <laughs> can, you can you explain the, the yeah, Gentleman's the, Agreement? The, 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 the they the might not be called gentlemen yeah, today. Yeah, the Gentleman's Agreement wasn't very gentlemanly. Right. But it basically was a verbalized doctrine that banned blacks from playing on white major league teams. Again, I find it fascinating. There was nothing written. Right just a verbalized agreement amongst players, managers, and owners that essentially said, if you allow a black to play with you, you can't play with us. And that governed Major League Baseball essentially for the next six decades until Jackie Robinson re-breaks right. the color barrier in Major League Baseball. Right. Let's go take a look at the at the, at the whole of this museum, this great museum, the whole story. Well, I can't wait to welcome you back. Let's go do it. Okay, great. Bob, you have brought us to uh, a, a special place here. Yes. Um, we, we, we're here, I'm leaning on the outfield wall <laughs> of the Negro Leagues field. And tell me, tell me about the field. What's the story of this? There was some thought that went into how we laid out the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. So the field that you're talking about is called the Field of Legends. 
and it is a mock baseball diamond that houses 10 of 12 life-size bronze sculptures of Negro League greats. The significance being they represent 10 of the first group of Negro Leaguers to be inducted into the National Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York. So that's how our all-star team was chosen. On the outside looking in is our friend, the late great John Jordan Buck O'Neill. Right. Our most recent inductee into the National Baseball Hall of Fame. The great ambassador of the oh, Negro absolutely. Leagues and black baseball. And, and in this capacity, he is managing this great all-star team that we assemble. So what we hoped would happen was that our guests would walk in through the turnstiles, peer through that chicken wire backstop, see this incredible display, and we hope it gives them that desire that, oh, I can't wait to get out on the field, walk amongst the statues, take my pictures with the statues. But you see, here at the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, we segregate you from the field. We wanted our visitors, particularly my younger audience, to at least remotely experience what segregation was like. So in the case of these tremendously talented and courageous athletes, they knew full well that they were good enough to play in the major leagues. So close to it, yet so far from it. So from most vantage points in the museum, you can see the field, but you can't get to it. And the only way that you're allowed to take the field here at the Negro Leagues Museum, you have to earn that right. And you do so by, whole story. Uh -huh, by learning their story. Yeah. And as I say, by the time you've bared witness to everything that they had to endure just to play baseball, the very last thing that happens is now you can take the now field. you can take the field. So, Bob, we have now earned the right yes. to be on the field with these incredibly great players. These guys have become legendary. I think more legendary in their way than most uh, of the great white ball players, with a couple of exceptions like Babe Ruth, Ruth you know, yeah. who certainly Ruth has, has, le le yeah. has become legendary. And they are larger than life. And I, I think that's the, one of the glories yeah. of this museum yeah. is a bunch of larger than life folks. And they did. They inspired legions of kids to dream about the possibility of playing baseball. But it seems to me that's the importance of this museum mm -hmm. too, is mm -hmm. those lessons, the lessons from these yes. great figures. Yes, and that's what we talk about. We talk about not only the historical aspect that is so well documented and substantiated here. It's a wonderful slice of baseball and Americana, but the inspirational aspect of what this story represents may be as meaningful, if not more meaningful, than the historical piece that this represents. And the life lessons that stem from this story of triumph over adversity. You won't let me play with you in the major leagues. I'll create my own league. Right. And as I remind folks, when you stop to think about that, that is the American way. And so while America tried to prevent them from sharing in the joys of her so-called national pastime, it was the American spirit that allowed them to persevere and prevail. What's not to love about this story? It was just a matter of giving people an opportunity to have access to it. If you're gonna talk baseball, you wanna to talk to author and sports journalist, Joe Posnanski a former senior columnist for Sports Illustrated and columnist for the Kansas City Star. Joe sat down with me during my visit here to help put the contributions of the Kansas City Monarchs, Jackie Robinson, and the Negro National League in perspective. Tell us a little bit about that invisibility of the, of the Negro Leagues and how this museum is, is making it visible. Yeah, I, I mean, for me, of course, every, it starts like every part of sort of my baseball writing journey starts with Buck O'Neill. And I think what's so interesting is for many, many, many years, 30, 40 years, Buck O'Neill would tell the stories that would later become famous. But he was telling those stories for so many years and nobody listened. And I got to know Buck sort of right when his fame was beginning to grow. Right. But the thing that always struck me was Buck used to say, I told these same stories. The stories haven't changed. And nobody listened, nobody listened for so long. And I think there was a conscious effort to sort of ignore the Negro Leagues. It was, it's an ugly part of America, right? Is the racism that prevented 
these great players from playing. And I think a lot of people didn't want to look back. A lot of African-American didn't want to look back. They, they, there, there was a real pain in looking back. And Buck is the one that said no. There's, yes, of course there was prejudice, and of course there was hatred, and of course it was wrong, but there was so much joy, and there was so many great players. Of course, famously, Jackie Robinson That's right. was here for a year. One year, Monarchs, exactly. So really, really a lot less than a year, a few months. Uh, not very happily, right. it should be said. On the other hand, it was his ticket in. It was Exactly. It was the, and it was the Willie Mays played just escalator. a few games in the Negro Leagues, right. you know. So there, there are people on that end. And then there are people on the other end who, like Satchel Paige, who had an entire career and then was able to, to be in the major leagues for a little while. But on the other hand, Satchel really did. He had created Satchel's All-Stars. And, and, and actually, the Negro Leagues was substantially about that. The, the, the seasons were sometimes only 60 or 80 games long. Yeah, it was, the league was just run differently. I mean, a lot of them, you know, there were league games that were usually played on Sundays, double headers, after church. After church, know, they, they, they reschedule church. Very famously right. would, yeah, schedule church a little early for the games. And between the league games, they, they played every day. And, and so sometimes they played each other. Sometimes they played factory teams and, and, and farm teams. And so it, the league was set up very differently, which, you know, makes it very difficult to look at, say, stats. You can look at the stats that are sort of become official and they are league play. They're the highest level of play. But they don't give you the full flavor of what a full season was like. And, and they don't give you a flavor, which there was a substantial amount of, which is more, more and more the statistics around this are, are being dug up, is in the barnstorming, they would frequently play all-star teams of, from the major leagues sure. or, or actual major league teams, the Yankees frequently. And the records, as it turned out, of those games are pretty favorable to the Negro League yeah. players. Yeah, the Negro League players won most of those games. I mean, they, they had a, and this was against very, very high level competition. I mean, Bob Feller would have a, a team, Joe DiMaggio would play in these games, Ted Williams would play in these right. games. So we're talking the highest level and, uh, Buck used to talk about that. Buck O'Neill used to always say, he'd say, well, it's no surprise that we won those games because those games mattered more to us. The greatest players had incredible respect, almost to a man, for the players in the Negro Leagues. And Buck used to talk about that too. He said, you know, not only does sort of game recognize game, you know, that idea, but also they didn't feel threatened, right. you know? So Joe DiMaggio would say point blank, the greatest pitcher he ever faced was Satchel Paige. Of course, as we mentioned at the beginning of the program, baseball is just one side of this story when it comes to preserving the cultural legacy of 18th and Vine. Just a few steps next door, and you're dropped inside an immersive world dedicated to a truly unique American art form, jazz. It's in the American Jazz Museum that I spoke with a few more experts about this community's rich musical heritage. Muriel. I wonder if you would tell us a little bit about why the Jazz Museum, the American Jazz Museum, is here at 18th and Vine in Kansas City. Well, we are fortunate to be part of the community. We are in the area that jazz grew up. And uh, we are so interested in not only the history of our uh, musicians. We say this is not a hall of fame. This is a collection of ideas and dreams that flowered into what became Kansas City Jazz. So because we are part of the community, we are representing the music, the neighborhood, the people who attended these concerts, the people who gave lessons, the people who made the life of these musicians better by being their neighbors and being their friends. And Chuck, the, 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 uh, the neighborhood was pretty incredible. 18th and Vine was the center of jazz and uh, a whole lot else. One of the reasons that jazz happened here is that Kansas City was known as the most wide open city in America. Why was it known as that, and what, what what was this neighborhood's contribution? To well, 18, 18th and Vine was, in, during the days of public gate, public segregation, was the heart and soul of the African American community. 
Buck O'Neill, great ball player, told me that when someone would come to town from, from like Lexington, Missouri, or, and they wanted to find a relative, they would ask where that relative was. Maybe they didn't know where he lived or that person lived. So they would say, stand on the corner of 18th and Vine, and, and they'll walk, they'll walk by. by there at some time. And it was, <laughs> there were clubs here, but also it was the business district. Mm -hmm. uh, the Lincoln Building, which was established in 1921, formed uh, the, the cornerstone of the district. And it was a home of offices for professionals, lawyers, dentists, uh, and, and anything that was denied anything or service that was denied downtown, African-Americans could get here. And the influence of this is, is important in, in many larger senses, not just the, the history of jazz, but the history of literature as well, Arnold. Langston Hughes grows up not far away from Kansas City, and his mother's here. So he, he ends up coming to Kansas City and experiencing this culture. Clearly, it's important to him as he gets to Harlem and the Harlem Renaissance, which really in some ways starts here with Langston, with Aaron Douglas. Lincoln High School creates part of the, the African-American culture, graduating people like uh, Aaron Douglas. What would you say about Hughes and Ellison and, and their relationship to, to jazz? Well, I think it's crucial to, to their development and their work as, as writers, absolutely crucial. They, I think one thing that strikes me is that um, even as a professor of literature, or as a literary critic and so on, uh, we have to see music as being the central uh, art form of black America. Hugh saw that that way. I think to some extent Ellison saw it that way also, even though he, uh, he was very interested in all kinds of literature. But Hugh saw it and understood it, and the great task of the writer was to somehow capture the spirit of virtuosity of uh, jazz musicians in their work. Between 20 and 40, this was the conservatory for jazz. This was That's where great. the seeds were planted, where the people learned their lessons, where, you know, it just grew. Of course, then they have to go off and practice their art form. And um, they went around the world. One of the things that, uh, uh, that really also set Kansas City apart is there was a really strong music education program mm -hmm. in, the, in, the, in the grade schools and also the high schools. And it was started by Major N. Clark Smith, who was the bandmaster at Lincoln. And Charlie Parker was really the beneficiary of that, too. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, he played in the marching band at Lincoln, and he played also in the, the orchestra at Lincoln, too. And then after school, there's a long tradition of the tradition being passed on from older musicians to younger musicians. Uh, we saw that with Ahmed al mm -hmm. He continued that tradition. Yes. Uh, Charlie Parker learned from Buster Smith. And so they, they passed the tradition on to the next generation. And that's still happening here in the Blue Room. If you come here on a Monday night for the, quote, Blue Monday session, right. you'll see a lot of young cats with their horns waiting to get up on yes. stage. Through the American Jazz Museum, we have Jazz <clears throat> Academy, which starts with junior high school students through high school students. We had a young man who was our intern here, and he said, Miss Muriel, I can't come in on Friday. I said, oh, is everything okay? He said, well, I got a gig tonight. I'm like, okay, <laughs> all right. And he was just a junior in high school. In the spirit of the dual nature of this building and the two museums it houses, it turns out Arnold Rampersad knows a little something about baseball in addition to his deep knowledge of literature and jazz. I couldn't pass up the opportunity to ask him about his take on one of the greatest ever to play the game. Arnold, uh, one of the less well-known uh, parts of Jackie Robertson's biography, his history, is that his first professional baseball experience was here in Kansas City with the Monarchs. It wasn't planned, but it happened and was his first professional experience. Yes, um, and I mean, it's very important because at UCLA where he was on the baseball team, he didn't do very well. Who knew that he would become, you know, what he became eventually? But and it did start with Kansas City, and it did start with a sort of accident of his being at a, a park and a ball rolling at his feet. I mean, his story is almost too good to be true. And he throws the ball to uh, to the player, and uh, and the conversation ensues, and he ends up in in Kansas City. 
Though I think there's also one other story in, in the Jackie Robinson story that is important and that could have ended up ending, ending his having any kind of chance of career. And, but when he was in the army during World War II, he was court-martialed yes. because he stood up to a bus driver and he felt bus driver was not treating him right. as an officer, right. as, which he was. I'm sure the bus driver was not treating him as an officer. Um, uh, and um, and he could have all ended right there, but he stood his ground. And uh, the remarkable thing is that he survived that, which could have ended almost his 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 life, his mature life. And um, and then Branch Rickey went on to choose him, and I think he chose him in part, I would suppose, because of how he be comported right. himself in that uh, in that situation. But he, he wouldn't have necessarily been picked for baseball because of his batting average. He was really picked because of his character. His character, yes. While the 18th and Vine community initially flourished in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, economic hardships hit the neighborhood hard in the back half of the 20th century. But thanks to a renewed investment in this neighborhood and the tireless efforts of those like Reverend and Representative Emanuel Cleaver, 18th and Vine is once again playing the role of vital cultural center since no visit to Kansas City is complete without a little local barbecue, I met Congressman Cleaver at Gates Barbecue, which has its own roots in this neighborhood as well, to get both the Congressman and our friend Ollie Gates' take on the incredible cultural gifts that the African-American community has given to our country. And so, Ollie, 1946, yes. your father yes. inherits, buys, Henry Perry's old barbecue, the Old Kentuck. We've got a picture of it right back here. But the, the Old Kentuck, when you go back to the 20s and, and the 30s, it was the barbecue place for 18th and Vine, for the jazz musicians. Yes. And, and they used to come and play. It was a combination. Right. Yeah. It was, it was a club. Big <laughs> easy. <laughs> and I mean, you're still today. You can you, you can get good uh, good uh, liquor here at, yes. the, at the Gates Barbecue. Yes. Uh, I used to. I used to like. But going. it's legal today. It's legal. Oh, that, that reminds us. Yes, that was prohibition in those days. And and though you've expanded way beyond 18th and Vine in many ways, um, 18th and Vine is still a home. Oh, absolutely. And, and 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 the two of you together have been the two people who have tried to restore, to rebuild 18th and Vine, the Negro Leagues Museum and the Jazz American Jazz Museum. What can we do? to tell the world about 18th and Vine, which was so important to the music of this country. And we fed baseball players uh, in the Negro Leagues out of Old Kentuck and elsewhere. How can we tell the world about its importance? The world probably uh, does not understand where some things came from. And what we need to do is make sure they're connected with Kansas City. For example, the Negro Leagues were formed right off of 18th and Vine right. uh, at Paseo YMCA, the YMCA, the home of Charlie Parker. Kansas City, right here. Count Basie made this his home. Satchel Paige, Satchel Paige made yeah. this his home. And Buck O'Neill, and it could go on and on and on with great jazz players, you know. And I think yeah, when Jamie you connect Jamie. all of that, uh, it was done in the in the middle of uh, a an African American economic center uh, around 18th and Vine, where you know if you think about it. There were black businesses back in uh, the 1940s and 50s huge, that huge, were successful. A, a huge amount of black businesses, uh, the hotels, barbers, tailors, you name it, all kinds of retail. The first black automobile dealership was in, uh, owned by a black man was in Kansas City. You're yeah. absolutely right. It's a very important place for small businesses. It's the only thing in this country that's known nationally. Yeah, 18 a, 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 absolutely. And internationally. Black culture in, in this city and in this country has made such a huge impact. And, and it's in food, barbecue, this is my favorite version of it, but there's lots, lots of other things as well. Jazz, baseball, politics, the movies, TV, et cetera. We're coming up to the 250th anniversary of the country. How do we celebrate that? How, how can we use that celebration to celebrate the things that we've just been talking about? This is a, an area rich uh, with history and we ought to exploit it. I think uh, people all over need to know some of the characters in Kansas City. Uh, Seldom Seen was a, a right. character in Kansas City. Jay McShann, all, all these magnificent jazz artists lived here and, 
and 18th and Vine jumped and jumped and jumped. And uh, there are a lot of us who believe there's still some jump left. So, you know, ju jumping is, of course, a, a jazz term, mm -hmm. uh, but it's pretty, it's pretty much a, a term for any live culture, including cuisine, including yes. food. All so right. is it still going to jump, Holly? Oh, so I'm with you. Okay. I, I don't have much longer here, but uh, the time that I you have. You look in pretty I, good shape. I yeah, for 91 say, years yeah, old, right, pretty good shape, yeah, you, but you, you, you use that term 91. <laughs> <laughs> The story of 18th and Vine is a civil rights story, a story of courage and the enduring power of sports and music to fulfill American dreams, dreams of freedom and equality. This is a community that has seen its fair share of ups and downs, and like any good comeback tale, it's clear after a visit here that this neighborhood story is still being written. I'm grateful to all our guests for providing some heartfelt insights into the vibrant history of Kansas City's African-American heritage. And I hope that you made a few of your own discoveries along the way as well. After all, that's what museums and libraries are for. I'm Crosby Kemper, and I'll see you next time for another episode of Visions of America, All Stories, All People, All Places.